never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
forgiveness of Jesus. May we always remember that in every circumstance, Lord God, that the goodness of Jesus remains in you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and uh, welcome to Pursuit Church. We're glad that you're here with us. Uh, if you're visiting with us uh, this morning, my name is, uh, well, my name is Dave Baker, but I'm uh, Pastor Dave Baker, and uh, just want to say welcome. Glad, glad that you're all here this morning. Well, uh, today is a very special day in the life of Pursuit, and you might ask why, and the answer is because it's Sunday. Um, and so uh, we'd like to acknowledge uh, what a special day this is. Uh, it's the best day of the week, as we always say. And uh, Jesus was resurrected on this day, and uh, God finished his work on this day, not the work of creation, but the work of redemption. And so we, uh, we come to worship the Lord. And uh, so at Pursuit Church, we are, we are pursuing a few things. We are pursuing belonging, believing, and becoming. Uh, we, we want to be a place where people can belong to one another. Uh, in the body of Christ, we do belong to one another. And uh, we want to know one another, we want to pray for one another, encourage one another. And so we, we are pursuing belonging. We're also pursuing believing. Uh, that means that we, we know the Word of God, we're, we're growing in our knowledge of it, um, but in our faith in it, uh, most of all. And uh, in becoming, we, we rejoice that God is changing us, who we are, into what we are becoming. And uh, we're becoming transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so we are, we are thrilled about that and what God is, uh, is doing in our lives, too. Well, this morning, um, I, this week was a, a good week for answered prayer. I can't tell you all of the things that uh, God answered, but there were some specific prayers of mine and others that, that the Lord answered this week. And so... I'd like to ask Connie to come and share one of those. Hello, hello. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> well, I was 12 years old. I asked Jesus into my life. I was a very scared little girl. I was scared of everything, and I thought, well, maybe Jesus could help me overcome this fear. And I memorized the verse John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And I was part of that world. But for some reason, I thought I was in a six to seven billion people I was just one of them, and that God really didn't look at me as a separate person, but as a whole with a group, the world. And it wasn't until 2005 that came about that I realized he did love me as Connie K. Andrews by myself. I was terrified of having cancer. That was my greatest fear in growing up. And in 2005, I heard a doctor say, Connie, it's cancer stage five, uh, two. You'll have to go through chemo and uh, radiation. Well, let me tell you, my world fell apart. I came home and I just sat down and I just, I couldn't even cry. I was so devastated. And I thought, well, that's what I, you know, God so loved the world and I'm part of the world, but he doesn't know me, Connie, and how afraid I am of this. Well, all of a sudden, I went to work the next day, not wanting to go to work, of course, and I was on the edge of tears all the time, and my stomach was a mess, and I was shaky and everything, and I finally said, Jesus, why don't you just take me now? Let me have a heart attack, and I'll just go to heaven now. As soon as I said it, this peace that I've never felt before in my life overflowed me, and I thought, wow. Did I, maybe I did die, and I'm in heaven. I looked around, and everybody was at their desk at work, and I thought, no, I'm still here. But it was the most incredible peace I've ever, ever experienced. And that peace carried me through nine months of treatments of radiation and chemotherapy. 
Well, then, 2024, uh, not 2024, 2021, I again heard the words, it's cancer, Connie. But this time, I seemed to be okay. I didn't, I wasn't worried. In fact, my one girlfriend that was taking me to different places for tests, she'd say, Connie, are you okay? And I said, well, yeah. Why? She says, well, you just seem so happy. I says, she had gone through the other one with me and knew how devastated I was until I got that piece. But I was okay with it. So we went and we had tests and everything, and I went through radiation again, not chemo this time, thank goodness, and everything was fine. I wasn't upset or worried or anything. And then I went for my six-month ch checkup in July of this year, and my doctor says, Connie, there is a, a problem. Your tumor level has gone up from your blood test, and I'm kind of concerned about that. Well, she told me all that I was going to have to go through. I decided I was going to die of radiation poisoning instead of cancer. She had me go through all these tests to see what was going on and where this tumor supposedly was. And I came home. And I was a little down. We were planning a trip to go visit friends and family, and I didn't want this hanging over my head. And then I said, okay, God, you've got to do your work again. And he did. He said, Connie, now just think about all that I've done for you. And I've gotten you through two treatments of cancer, and you're still here, and you're still at peace, and you're still doing my work. And so what do you think, I'm going to leave you now? No, I'm right here. And even if it isn't good news, you're going to go to heaven. And you're going to live with me. And think of all the people that have gone before that are your friends that you're going to see. Well, I got to dwelling on that, all the people that have gone before. And I thought, well, yeah, this isn't so bad. This would be great. So I got all excited. And the peace came over me again. And I went through all these tests. And then this Wednesday, I went to the doctor to see what the results of the test were. And she went over everything with me. And wouldn't you know, there was no tumor. She doesn't know what brought my blood, the blood level up on the tumor count. She has no idea, but there was nothing there. The only thing they found was I have kidney stones. So <laughs> that's all I have. So and I'll take that. So anyway, I just want to give praise to God that it took me going through all of this, which I thought was going to be just horrendous, turned out to be the best thing for me, because I know that God loves Connie K. Andrews. So that was what I learned from that lesson, and I hope I never doubt it again. So it's been a, a wonderful time with the Lord, improving himself to me. And uh, I just hope that you all feel the same, that he loves you individually, not just in a clump of people, but he loves each one of you individually and knows you by name. So all praise to him. Thank you so much, Connie. And uh, we love Connie K. Andrews, too. Um, and uh, so glad for that good news. And uh, she told me this week in a text that the doctor said she's good for another 50,000 miles. So <laughs> I don't know what that means, but <clears throat> anyway. So, okay. Uh, each week, uh, we just started uh, last week that we are going to have a time of prayer. And so Maestrum is going to come and, and lead us in that. Good morning, church. I'm encouraged by that, Miss Connie. Um, and that kind of goes along with the theme of what we're going to be praying today. So I don't know if you felt a bit of, you feel comfortable in your chairs, right? You feel cozy? <laughs> Do you, you feel, yes, <laughs> you can talk. <laughs> um, and that same comfort carries us everywhere it seems. But are we too comfortable? Do we go out in the world and not share the gospel where we can? Do we not extend our testimonies when we can? So our prayer for today is using everything that we have, our resources, our talents to give God glory, 
in the church and outside, that we may never get so comfortable that we forget the goodness of God and how we can extend it out to the people we know and we meet. We're going to read from Psalms 108, verses 1 through 5. It reads, My heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises with all my heart. Wake up, lyre and harp. I will wake, I will wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. For your unfailing love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. So we don't have lyres and harps now in 2023, but we do have our mouths, our voices, our legs, our feet to go out and preach the gospel and to share the goodness of God with those that we meet. So let us pray today together that we may never get too comfortable in this life, that we can be uncomfortable and do the uncomfortable things that require us to push the gospel forward. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you and we glorify you. We We thank you for the goodness of God, Lord God. Thank you, like Connie said, that you see us individually and also as a collective, Lord God. And we pray that in, even though that we can relish in the goodness of God, that we don't get so comfortable, that we don't forget the trials and tribulations and the tests and the triumphs that you pull us through, Lord God, and that we can share that with the people that we meet and come across, Lord God. We ask that we can become full of zeal, Lord God, to praise you with everything inside of us, to honor you with our lives, with everything we do, with our resources, our time, our finances, and um, how we steward ourselves, Lord God. I ask that as we become more comfortable in the spirit, Lord God, that we do the uncomfortable things that are needed to push your gospel along. Use us, O Lord, to serve you for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Good morning, church. (laughs) As a church, we have been going through the 1689 London Baptist uh, Confession of Faith. And uh, we're in chapter 6 of the fall of men, of sin, and the punishment thereof. Those who are regenerated still have a corrupted nature, although through Christ it is pardoned and put to death. This corrupted nature and all sinful actions that result from it are still truly and actually sin. And some verses that go along with this would be 1 John 1 through 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Galatians 5, 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And finally, Romans 7, 18, and uh, 23 and 25. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Thank you, Amy. So uh, next week will be the last in our series on the Ten Commandments. So I... uh, some weeks ago, we, we started talking about 20 weeks in the Ten Commandments. And uh, we pretty much did that, but it's going to turn out to be 17 weeks in the Ten Commandments. Doesn't sound as, not as nice ring there, but it's because lately I've been taking one week uh, per each commandment rather than the two. And uh, so 
I just want to let you know that uh, next week we will do the Tenth Commandment, and uh, we will also uh, start after that in November a a, uh, a new series on what is a disciple. And so we will be doing that uh, for the month of November, and then of course we we get into Advent uh, for Christmas. So please please pray with me now. Father, we, we thank you for this day to bring us together to worship you. Lord, most of all, we thank you that, that we as your children, we know you. Uh, you've revealed yourself to us in our heart, just as you did uh, especially with, with Connie that day. Lord, you've, you've shown us that we belong to you. And Lord, we just want to say thank you for that. We rejoice in that knowledge. Lord, I pray that each one of us would step out in faith this week to genuinely pray for, for something, something that's very real to them, something that they need. And so, Lord, and, and help us to look with expectation to you answering those prayers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I invite the, the deacons to come and receive your tithes and offerings. the Lord. 
receive. Help us to have listening ears and receiving hearts, Lord God. May all glory and praise be given to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated. Children can be dismissed to their class. Tomorrow morning, I am going to the uh, podiatrist because I'm having uh, some trouble with my feet hurting, hurting more than they should. Um, so he's going to tell me some news, I guess, uh, from the recent blood test that he had me take. Um, so there is this diagnosis phase um, that we go through, and then hopefully there is a prescription phase um, where they have a solution. So like take these pills or... Uh, I'll give you a shot of cortisone, or there's a surgery that we can do. So we all have to go uh, to the doctor for various reasons, um, and uh, whether to see if we have COVID or to talk to them about our migraines or our heart problems or annual test results. Um, but we go for one or two reasons. One, uh, first of all, because we think that there's something wrong or know that there is. Um, or the other one is that we hope there isn't something wrong. Uh, and for most people, there's also this time period that it takes for us to finally go to the doctor, um, and it's longer than it should be because nobody likes to go to the doctor. So step one <clears throat> is we recognize the problem. So in dealing with any problem, <clears throat> of course, there is this, this time where we have to recognize that there is a problem. And so we recognize the problem because we experience the symptoms. Now, God gives us bodies that feel pain, and he alerts us to the fact, this alerts us to the fact that we have a problem in our bodies. So as a little kid in Arizona, I used to run around barefooted all summer, and uh, we had this side yard next to our house. Um, and in that side yard, there were what we call bullhead thorns. Now, there's a picture of them. Um, they're about a quarter inch across. Um, but I, can, I can't tell you how many times I walked across that yard in my bare foot and pulled stickers out of my feet. Um, and so I guess I wasn't too smart. Um, despite the pain, I just kept doing it. Like I said, I can't tell you how many times I pulled stickers out of my feet. So the first step is, again, we recognize that there is a problem. So we also go to the doctor, <coughs> secondly, because we have hope that we will find a solution. Otherwise, we would not go. Um, so in step two, in, in getting the solution to the problem, it's actually taking the advice of the doctor and using the solution. And so step two, use the solution. Now, I know that's really profound, and I'll give you a minute to think about it and soak it in. Uh, just kidding. But as a kid, like I say, I probably walked across that yard 50 or 100 times and plucked stickers out of my feet. And once in a while, I thought, well, maybe I should uh, put some shoes on. Um, but I was reluctant to use the solution. And so I was either really stupid or really stubborn, or maybe I was just an optimist in a really stupid world. Um, but uh, in any case, I use these medical examples and examples of, of painful events because, of course, I want to illustrate a spiritual point. And uh, so when it comes to solving our spiritual problems, um, we can use the same analogies. If we are spiritually astute, um, unlike my young self, we would first recognize that there is a problem. So we do this by feeling the symptoms of our spiritual problems, and there are many of them. And so we can, we can feel a sense of guilt, perhaps. We feel guilt. Um, and so the question is, why do you feel guilty? It's because you are. You are. And so we feel this sense of guilt. We can feel loneliness or also a sense of alienation from God. We can feel purposelessness in our lives, like, why am I here? What am I doing? Uh, we can feel that too. And so no matter how much we try to be a better person, we can also feel like I'm just getting worse. What's going on here? And so these are all 
These are all spiritual problems, and we recognize them by the symptoms. And so, first of all, before seeking a solution, of course, we have to recognize that there is a problem. And so our bodies tell us through pain, and God tells us about spiritual problems through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit uh, speaks to us in our heart. And so we read from John 6, 44, Jesus was speaking to some, some people, and he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so God is, Jesus is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit that comes from God to speak to your hearts and to draw you to, to faith in him. And so I would not, uh, we would not seek out a podiatrist unless uh, such a thing existed or that you lived in a place or a time where they actually had podiatrists. Um, similarly, we, we can see that God, through his Holy Spirit, draws people to himself. Uh, Jesus said that first, in order to come to him, we must be taught by God. Um, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So we first recognize the problem because we experience the symptoms, and then we go to seek a solution. We come to God. So Jesus is the solution to our problem. Um, our problem is not all of these symptoms that we feel, the guilt or the, the worry or the purposelessness or, or the alienation that we feel. Those are not the problems. They are the symptom of the problem. And so the Bible says that sin is the problem, the sin that's resident inside of us. Um, that's the problem. And so sin causes the problems of us being alienated from God. And so in Romans 9, or Romans 3, verse 9, uh, the Apostle Paul here uh, wants to make sure everybody knows that everybody is covered by this problem of sin. And he says, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, everyone in the world, in, in his, that way of reckoning, are under sin. And as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And so we see a contrast there between those two verses that I've already read. Is No one seeks for God on their own, but Jesus says that the Holy Spirit comes and draws us to God. So we see that being drawn to God is a work of God. So the, the end result of, this, uh, of our, our sin nature is that we are alienated from God. This is the problem. And the result of that alienation is spiritual death. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, it says the, wage, the wages or payment of sin is death. But it goes on to say this, and this is a verse that changed my life when I heard this verse right here. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. When I heard that, I, I recognized, yeah, I'm a sinner. It has to be a free gift. There's no way I could earn anything from God because I have sinned, and uh, there's no way to undo that. So there's this problem, and it's called sin. And its solution, the Bible says, is somehow in Jesus. Um, it's Jesus. It's not Buddha. It's not Shintoism. It's not shamanism. It's not Rastafarianism or some other spiritual solution. It's Jesus. And John says in, in John 14, he was talking about what Thomas said to Jesus. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. That's a very exclusive claim that Jesus made. So some people get offended that Christianity is so exclusive. Well, how about a little gratefulness instead that there is an answer 
um, there is a solution. So would you get mad at the pharma company that, that came up with the, uh, the cancer drug that would cure your form of cancer? So we might say, well, you're, we wouldn't say you're so exclusive. And we might get mad if they tried to uh, not share it with the world or they tried to you know, make a bunch of money on it uh, and, and not make it available. But we don't get mad at the pharma company because they have the only solution. So in any case, the solution to our spiritual condition of alienation and the impending spiritual death, um, it, that costs God his son hit in a brutal death to pay for our sins. Um, and yet, the Bible says, God offers that gift to us for free. He gives it, the solution is free. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the wages of sin and death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God the Father had Jesus the Son, as we know, come to the earth. To, he had to live a perfect life. He had to live out all of those laws that God specified in the Old Testament, and he had to do it perfectly. He fulfilled all the requirements of the law so that he could be a righteous and perfect substitute for us. Um, so we don't really how, understand how that works in God's mind exactly. It seems a little mysterious that somebody could be our substitute, but it is. The Bible says that that's the truth. Jesus is our substitute. So we have this solution. And so <clears throat> the point is we have to use the solution. Um, the solution is to renew our relationship to God, to be rightly related to him um, and we can do that by putting our faith in Christ and his death on the cross for you. When we put our faith in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross to pay and cover for all of our sins, this spiritual transaction happens between us and God. We are, we are forgiven. There's a new transformation that takes place inside of our heart and God accepts us, and we are rightly related to him. There will never be a mention of sin again because Jesus paid it for us. So we put our faith in Christ, and uh, the issue of sin is dealt with uh, first. So there's no other solutions. There are no other solutions besides this because the problem can't be simplified any more than that. So the doctor tells you there's only one solution to your headaches. You must stop hitting yourself in the head with a hammer. Stop doing that. Okay? There are no other solutions to those headaches because there's only that one problem. It can't be simplified any more than that. And so the same there are no other leaders of other religions. There are no other religions we should follow because they don't deal with that issue, the one issue, and that's sin. So as a child, I was either uh, too stupid or optimistic to use the solution um, as I walked barefoot through that side yard. So let's not be optimistic. Um, we can't just say, oh, it's okay with me and God. We can't say that. Um, it will not be okay. Because God says, as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes judgment. Judgment is coming for our sin, but instead God allows us to put our faith, he brings us, he draws us to put our faith in Jesus. And then that substitution is made. I am now not alienated from God anymore. I made right with God. I have peace with God, as it says in Romans 5. We have peace with God because we have been, we've been brought near to God through the gospel. So um, before we get to our uh, commandment this week, um, let's recognize these two things. Um, the relationship matters. And so just like going to your, your doctor 
having a relationship with your doctor is the first step. Okay, that's the first step with God, and it's the whole point, actually. Being rightly related to God. That is the solution that we're looking for. But there's also a secondary solution, and that is um, we, we, take this, we take the solution that he gives, and so even more so with God. So we're going to see that as we go through this again, our relationship with God made possible through Christ is the first part of the solution, and it's the point of the solution, to be right with God. Also, our relationship, <coughs> our relationship with God is what Christianity is all about. Um, and so we have to, also, we use the solution, and the second part is that we walk in the Spirit. Okay, part one is having a relationship with God. Part two is walking with God in the Spirit, continuing to be with God. And so uh, as Christians, the question is, why, why do we study these commandments, these, these Ten Commandments that were written 1,400 years or so before Jesus even came? And so 3,500 years ago. So as Christians, we understand that we are saved by an act of God's grace um, through Jesus being our substitute. Uh, we know that we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Um, so we might ask, why study all these old laws that no one could keep anyway? Um, are, aren't we just supposed to live the Christian life in the Spirit? Well, that is a good question, but the fact is that we are supposed to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul. And so we are freed, we are freed from living the letter of the law. The New Testament is very clear about that. But we are not freed from living out the principles of the law. And so the principles of the law are what the Holy Spirit is going to be working in and through your life. And so we might as well have some idea of what he's doing what direction he wants us to go in all of these different situations. And so let's, uh, let's begin to look at our, the ninth commandment. And the ninth commandment is found in Exodus 20, verse 16. And, of course, the Lord came down with smoke and fire upon that mountain before all the people in a loud trumpet blast and gave all of the Ten Commandments. And the ninth one is, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so the word false in this original Hebrew language, of course, just means falsehood and also deception. We should not deceive our neighbor, and we should not speak falsehood. So we're not to speak falsely or deceptively about our neighbor in a court setting. So that's, that is the immediate context of this verse. It, it does speak about giving testimony don't give false testimony in a court-type setting against your neighbor. That's the, the narrow uh, understanding of this. And so the concern of the Bible is also that we do no harm to our neighbor, especially as we have seen that there are severe consequences to breaking those Ten Commandments. Um, so in some cases, it could be a death sentence uh, to a person, if they were convicted of breaking one of these Ten Commandments, like in, in particular, a murder um, or adultery um, in certain cases. And so if you were in a court setting and testifying to someone, your words could result in a death sentence. So that is why the Bible rec requires that if someone is going to be convicted of a death penalty, that the accuser and that the accuser, or, that, or that's the one who testifies, will have to be the first one to throw the first stone. Okay, so as the accuser and the one that testifies, you had to throw the first stone. And so we find this in Deuteronomy 17. It says, the hand of the witness shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. You shall purge the evil from your midst. Um, so that's one of the places it talks about that. So it makes uh, speaking the truth really important because of the consequences of it. So the Bible says that not speaking truthfully 
not speaking truthfully is equal to violence against that person. And so in Exodus 23, we see this. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. And so God is saying when we're speaking the truth, we're not to be partial. We're supposed to speak the truth, not side with the many, not side against somebody because they're poor or you're siding with the rich, but we're also not su supposed to side with the poor necessarily either. We are supposed to speak the truth. And so the, uh, the word for malicious um, in Hebrew is the word Hamas. Um, in Hebrew, it means violence. And so we do violence when we do not speak the truth. So we are not to be partial either. It says that we do not defend the poor when it's not the truth, nor be a part of the majority. So God does want us to defend the poor because they're often the ones that uh, get the, the short end of the stick. He does want us to defend them from injustice, but not when it's not true. That would create another injustice. So God's law specifies uh, what was to happen to a false witness and also how testimony was to be examined in court, in their court. And so in Deuteronomy 19, listen to this. It says, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. Um, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days, and the judges shall inquire diligently. And if the witness is a false witness, and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge evil from your midst. And so being a false witness also had a consequence. Um, and so the judges, what they would do is they would cross-examine the witness of, in, a, in a crime. Say there's like up two witnesses or even three, they would separate them and then they would examine them with seven questions. They would talk about, okay, what time was it? What place was it? And all these other details in order to make sure that they were really there, that they were really a witness. And then they would ask other details like, what was the murder weapon used, uh, for example? Uh, the, the clothing worn by the murderer. And what was the clothing worn by those that were murdered? Um, and it, it had to match up perfectly or there was no execution of the accused. And so it made this capital punishment uh, pretty much, it was virtually impossible. Um, but so their legal system like ours is to make sure as much as possible that innocent people are not murdered legally by the court. Um, and so they're not murdered, which is a sixth commandment, you shall not murder. But by giving false testimony, you're, you're in a sense murdering someone or potentially murdering somebody and putting that onto the court to now murder them. And so that system of examination is what was to prevent that from happening. And so they had to examine the testimonies of, of people. So uh, just by the way, um, you may recognize that uh, these laws were not followed for Jesus in his trial. Um, in Mark 14, it says this, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. So they broke their own law in executing Jesus, but of course it was God's providence that Jesus be executed for us. Now, so the core of this uh, commandment is to not bring any injury to your neighbor by not speaking the truth. So there's this uh, theologian, Dennis Olson, um, 
summarize the various laws that relate to this ninth commandment like this. It says they seek to preserve the reputation, dignity, and respect of the people within the community, whatever their status or condition within the society. So these, these laws against uh, false testimony um, sought to protect people. So John Calvin said something similar. <clears throat> He says, to this prohibition, the command is linked that we should faithfully help everyone as much as we can in affirming the truth in order to protect the integrity of his name and his possessions. And so those, those are the, that's the point of this not giving false testimony is to protect a person's reputation, their, their name, and also their possessions. And so we're to, we are to protect a person's possessions and we are to protect their name. And uh, as we've stated many other times as in these last uh, 15 weeks, um, it's, not, it's not only what the commandment prohibits that we care about, but we're also commanded to do the opposite. When God says, you shall have no other gods before me, that's a prohibition. But what is he... But how do we live that out? We have God as our only God. Okay, we do the positive side of that. You shall not murder. Well, we're not, not just murdering somebody, but we give them life. We do everything we can do to benefit their life. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. And so it's not just the prohibition, but it's the opposite also. So not only do we not give false testimony, but we must also only give true testimony. We only say what's true, or we should say nothing at all. So now, do we ever see that in our world around us? Uh, someone protecting the name of a, a neighbor or an opponent? Um, so how hard is that? Apparently, it's pretty hard. Um, so let's look at ourselves first. So how do we give false testimony? Now, we're not, I'm broadening this from ev to everyday life, not just a courtroom setting. We need, to, we need to think about this. So let's look at ourselves first. So we can lie by not stating the whole truth, um, just giving a part of it, right? We're all familiar with that little way of deceiving one another. We just tell them part of, part of the story and hope that that'll suffice and, you know, they're not going to catch us in this. So we can lie by not stating the whole truth, just a part of it. You know, when you go into court, what do they say? I swear to, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So we've all done that, uh, given part of the, the truth, and we hope the other person won't figure it out. So I, I tell people um, in, when we're in different leadership capacities of the church that if you hear one side of the story you've heard none of the story. And that's a good axiom to, to kind of remember. If you've heard only one side of a story, you've heard none of it. And so it, Proverbs says a similar thing in Proverbs 18. It says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him, right? So we can, we can imagine that happening. Somebody gives up and they give their passion plea, and it's like, ah. Oh. You know, we're all for that. And then the other person comes up and says, that's not how it happened at all. This is what happened. Oh, and we're going, oh, yeah. Well. But this uh, giving of partial truth happens all the time uh, when we're trying to win an argument, say even online, in a chat room or something. If we only partially or inaccurately represent an opponent's argument, we are giving false testimony. Okay, so a lot of times we build a little premise, you know, based on the opponent's argument, but it doesn't really represent what they're saying. So we're giving false testimony when we do that, and we're, we're forcing them, we're misrepresenting them and forcing them to argue against the false narrative. So this happens all the time on TV news, and that's like 100% of TV news nowadays. Nobody cares about what's actually true or what's balanced or anything. They don't ever talk about two sides of the story. It's always just narrative. And so the more uh, it's done more and more on TV, 
because there's no consequence to it um, for anyone on TV, producers included, uh, in breaking this ninth commandment. We don't fire anybody anymore uh, for deliberately uh, misrepresenting the truth. So we can lie um, also by stating the truth more emphatically than it deserves. Okay, so the emphasis can make a weak case seem stronger. So we can give an impassioned plea for something that's really just a minor part of the truth. And so we can lie by stating the truth more emphatically than it deserves. So a wife can tell her husband, you uh, never put the trash out until I ask you to. And so the purpose of the word never is, of course, to be more emphatic. Um, communications experts or marriage experts will say we should never say never. We should never say always to our spouse in an argument. So we can also lie by making generalisms and relating them as if they are, if they're true, completely true. So you could say she never looks, she never looks uh, when she backs out of the driveway. Um, well, we often make statements like that about people um, that we have no way of knowing. We don't know if she's looking. Maybe she's really good at using her mirrors. I'm just making up an example here. But we make all sorts of assertions about what people are doing without even really the ability to know if it's true or not. And so we lie when we, we speak about the motives of a person's heart, too. And so we usually have no way of knowing. So he says to her, well, you're just doing that to get back at me. Well, we don't know. We don't know what the, the truth of the motive is. So there's all different ways that we can, we can lie and use falsehoods. And uh, we, need, we need to examine ourselves. Now, let me, let me turn now to you as the neighbor Okay, so do you lie about yourself? Do you tell yourself things that are not true? And we do. So, um, so do you always tell the truth about, to yourself about yourself? Um, and it can go two ways. Uh, we can be too easy on ourselves or we can be too hard on ourselves, right? Um, so we can lie to ourselves uh, when we dismiss our sinfulness, for example oh, I'll get over it, or I'll do better next time, or whatever. Um, and this can just be being naive, um, but it can also be on purpose. But most of the time, I would say that uh, we are brutal to ourselves. Um, <clears throat> we say, you're such a lousy person. Or we'll say, you're lazy and you'll never amount to anything. Or we'll say, you're, you're too shy and you won't get past it. Um, and so we think that because we're talking um, about ourselves that we can take all the filters off. We take all the filters off and just say it like it is. Okay, because we're talking to ourselves. We'll just say it like it is in our head. Okay, um, but the problem is we don't know how it is, even about ourselves. We don't know the truth even about ourselves. So listen to Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Okay, so that's an admonition from the Word of God that you cannot even understand your own heart. You do not know you. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart, and I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So only God knows how it is with us. So when we judge ourselves by introspection or our motives, um, we judge ourselves as if we had a kind of a stretchy ruler. So one day it's like this, and the next day it's like this, right? When we judge ourselves, we are using a stretchy ruler. We don't know how it is. And so the better way to judge ourselves is by not trying to judge our motives. Um, why did I do that? Well, I did that because I'm a sinner. That's one thing that I do know, of course. But instead, we do what it says in John, John 1, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And Emmy read one of these in the 1689. It says, if we walk 
in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, that's one thing we can be sure of, that there is sin in us, and that it is deceptive. But verse 9 says this, it says, we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he's faithful and just. Those two key words, faithful and just. So that's how we uh, speak the truth about ourselves, is that we admit sin and uh, we believe the truth that Jesus already paid on the cross for those sins. So we confess them and we recognize that God is faithful. He will always forgive us our sin. It's not because we're confessing them. It's because Jesus died for us that they're forgiven. But we confess them and we recognize that God is faithful to forgive us our sins. But he's also, he's just. What does it mean he's just? He's, he's doing it according to justice. Jesus, God forgives you your sins because it's the right thing. It's just for him to forgive you because Jesus already died for those sins. God will do the right thing. He will forgive, and it's the right thing for him to do because Jesus died for you. And it's, it's not saying that to everyone. It's saying that to those who have put their faith in Jesus, that when we put our faith in Jesus, his forgiveness applies to us. <clears throat> so, um, this idea of, of confessing our sin and saying what's true about ourselves from the Word of God, confessing it and acknowledging that God will forgive us and that He is, uh, he is faithful and just, that's why Marcella's group, in Hiding His Word, um, where we gather online to memorize the Word, is valuable. Um, if we want to speak the truth to ourselves, we need to memorize God's Word. That's really the only way that we can, we can speak God's truth to ourselves, um, even as, as Christians and even been a Christian for a while. We can, we can judge ourselves wrongly, and uh, so we need to judge ourselves according to God's Word. So, all right. Um, so we think it's a good exercise goal to walk 10,000 steps a day, and it is. Um, your heart beats about 85,000 beats per day, um, and the words that come out of your mouth are about 15 to 25,000 words a day. So that means that there's one word per every three to four heartbeats. Right, and so that is why this commandment, this ninth commandment, is probably the commandment that's broken most often, most frequently. Our mouth runs, our mouth runs almost as much as our heart does, and frequently we are saying or thinking things that are not true about our neighbor or our friend or our spouse or our coworker or ourselves. Okay. So maybe we break this commandment, I'm saying conservatively, dozens of times every day about not speaking falsely about our neighbor, including ourselves. And so there's so much scripture about the use of the tongue that we could, we could literally read all day today and all day tomorrow and probably the next day before we could exhaust all that the Bible says about our tongue and, and truth. <clears throat> But uh, James, uh, who was the leader of the uh, Jerusalem church, and he was Jesus' half-brother, meaning uh, he's half-brother because Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, um, says this in James uh, chapter 3, verses 5. And he's talking about the tongue, and he says, So also the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Um, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and is set on fire by hell. So that tongue is a, is a spark 
that causes so much damage. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile or sea creature can, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And so he's saying that our mouth says both blessings and curses, and it shouldn't be so. And so, first of all, we, uh, we recognize the problem first. We need to recognize that there is a restless evil inside of us, okay? And we need God's help to cage it. Um, and so we need to use the solution. Um, Colossians 3, 9 through 10 says this, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Um, so if we believe the good news of Jesus and have come to him in faith, uh, the Bible says that we have a new nature. We have a new nature, and we put off the old self. And our new self is being renewed, the Bible says. So 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So this is what we rejoice in, that God has made us new. And so we also need to recognize that we need God's help perhaps more than any other place right here with what we say. It will involve confession when we say something wrong to someone. Um, that's confession to God, but also means that con we're confessing that we are forgiven in Christ. And so it involves apology to people by asking their forgiveness too. But most of all, it takes God ruling in your heart. Colossians 3 also says this, Put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. That means like putting up with each other, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule. Rule over that evil. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you're called in one body, and be thankful. So please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your, your word. We thank you for these, these commandments and how they are expanded on throughout the Old Testament to show us both the negative and the positive, to the, the limiting and the, and the fullness of what the commandment is really about. We thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will guide us in all truth so that we can become people that are conformed and made into the image of Christ. Lord Jesus, we ask you to rule. We need you to rule over our lives, our tongues, and our mouth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we do each week, we, uh, we celebrate communion uh, with one another. We, we celebrate uh, our remembrance of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we remember that and we rejoice. And so the way that we do that here is that um, we come forward and the, uh, the, the elements are here. Uh, so when, when you take a little cup, there's actually two there. On the bottom of it is the bread wafer. We'll take that together. And then on the top is the juice. And so um, let's come now and, uh, and partake together. You can go back to your seats, and I'll, I'll be saying some words and some reading some verses as we, as we come and gather together.
So 700 years before, 800 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words. But they were about Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid the iniquity of us iniquity of us all on him. So we, uh, we, we partake together. Um, the Apostle Paul said this, these words on the night that Jesus, last night, on the night that Jesus was, was betrayed, the Apostle Paul said this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's, uh, let's take together of the bread and give thanks. Lord Jesus, we give you, we give you thanks that you came. You said you uh, came as a ransom, to give your life as a ransom. So Lord, thank you for allowing your body to be beaten and crushed and whipped and speared and punctured for us to demonstrate God's righteousness, that a price had to be paid for our sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus for doing that. Apostle Paul continued, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's, let's drink together. Lord Jesus, likewise, we give you thanks for shedding your blood. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus, you did what you had to do in order to bring us the possibility of salvation. And Father, I pray that if anyone is here today that has not trusted you, that they would just open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you died for my sins. I want to give you my life. I want you to change me and make me the person that you want me to be. And we, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Tony's not here, so I am Tony today doing announcements. And uh, so I, don't, I didn't review all the announcements very good in advance, but there's a few that we need to be reminded of. And first of all, our uh, community groups are, are happening. So he's scrambling right now to find the community groups uh, uh, slide. There it is. And uh, so Hiding His Word is uh, happening Mondays at 8 p.m. And uh, that's where they get together online and uh, memorize some scripture. So they're working on memorizing all the Ten Commandments. And so uh, this coming Saturday, when we gather again for our international food night, our, one of our very best events of the whole year is uh, when we gather, we bring a, a gift of, from our particular ethnic tradition, and uh, we set them all out here, and uh, we partake together, kind of a taste of Orlando, a taste of pursuit. Um, we are, we're going to have a little contest later on uh, for this memorization, the kids against the adults. And uh, so we're going to have a talent show and an open mic, as we call it, as well. And it's going to be a great time, a fun time to get together and uh, just be together and share with one another. And so those, that event is happening this coming Saturday. So that will be October the 28th at 6 p.m. And so if you bring some food, maybe come a little bit early, say 5.30, we 
we'll get it set up, give you some table space, and uh, make a nice, bring a flag from your country maybe if, uh, so if you'd like to do that. And um, we'll, we'll have a wonderful time together. Um, well, I don't know what else to talk about in terms of announcements. Is there anything that I'm forgetting? Okay, Fall Festival, that's on November the 4th. That's also a Saturday. Um, and we're gonna be joining with some other, uh, another church uh, called One Hope Church and uh, Grace Journey Church. Um, and it, this'll, we're gonna be at their location. It's just over here on Colonial. And so we hope that everybody can come and be part of that and uh, just bringing the churches together and also meeting new people uh, from the community. And so that's, that's what we'd, we'd like to do. Is that it? You sing now? Okay. <laughs> Please stand. And now, the benediction, which is a blessing of the Word of God for you uh, for this week. I'm going to read from Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verses 15 through 17, and it will end with a very familiar verse. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Go and be blessed. Good morning. How are you? Good. Doing well? Oh, good. Yeah, on Sunday when I come late, I hit that. Oh. I travel yeah. time with my trip, with my business. Yeah.
this morning.